G'day guys, Macapithia Circle, and today's episode, I want to look back on all the different kits released this year, well, the different ranges, and I want to pick a good thing about that range and a bad thing about that range. So, in doing this, we're going to be positive and negative. There'll be glowing praise and a lot of harsh criticisms, but that's the nature of this channel, right? We don't dance around things we give you the truth um, honest opinion and that's what's gonna happen today now there'll be a few other videos like this uh, looking back on things that came out in a year and things that will come out next year of course in the next couple of weeks but for now well let's just get this one out of the way shall we so First things first, most disappointing thing to come out of the specialist games for me this year was the Adeptus Titanicus. Chiefly because of price. Um, now, whilst the kits look great, they look beautiful in fact, you can't charge that much money for what you get. I'm sorry, it's just... I know it's a nitpick, but this is bullshit okay um $180 for an Adeptus Titanicus Warlord Battle Titan jeez that is just ludicrous you know like $180 would have bought me three land raiders when I got into the hobby three land raiders you now actually when I got into the hobby it would have bought me four but let's say third edition Let's say 3rd edition would have bought you three brand new Land Raiders, which were very complicated and expensive kits at the time. Now, if people want to turn around and say, oh, yeah, but, you know, this thing is a complicated kit. Yeah, it is. But compare modern plastic injection molding technology to injection molding technology of 20 years ago, and it's not that impressive at all. You think about the quality of the current Mark III Land Raiders, um, what they were like 20 years ago. They were state-of-the-art to have moving parts and opening hatches and things like that in a Games Workshop tank. That was a huge deal. So I look at things like that. I also look at other game systems and game ranges and what they have to offer. And, you know, for the same sort of price as that, you can buy dozens and dozens and dozens of models in other game systems. Um, Mantic, for example, you could probably get like 70 or 80 zombies for the cost of this one model. It's just ludicrous on so many levels. And I think it's a real missed opportunity because you basically price your market so high that it's like, do you want Profit Games Workshop? Do you want people to collect your games and buy into them? Because it's not going to happen. Kids aren't going to buy into this game. And yeah, while well, there's some, uh, some people out there who are elitist and they go, oh, well, you know, good. This is a game that we want adults to play, you know, we want a mature group of people playing it and blah, blah, blah. Look, if enough people aren't playing it, they'll can it. Do you think you'll get spoiled with new releases and awesome new kits if nobody's playing the game because it's so expensive nobody bought the game? No, Games Workshop will just write it off as a lost cause. Like, oh, we're not making enough money out of it. Fuck it off. I think in a way they've insulated themselves against that though by charging so ludicrously much for the game uh, at launch, which is, yeah, phew, I don't know what they were thinking. What I would have loved to have seen instead with Titanicus is about half the cost. Yeah, half the cost. There's no reason why it shouldn't be, just corporate greed. Um, we've covered this before, it's got nothing to do with wages, it's got nothing to do with paying store rents and insurance and shipping and all that kind of like all that stuff combined into a single kit's like 40 cents it's ludicrous i know but yeah that's how it works it's like 40 cents a kit that's it um yeah wow so titanicus i hate it because it's missed potential i guess more than just the cost the cost is the thing that gives it the missed potential Anyway, speaking of good specialist games, we'll have a quest, Blackstone Fortress. This gave us a taste of what could be. We've got interesting characters, we've got an Imperial robot, we have Chaos, and this is Chaos Space Marines and a Chaos Lord people actually like. It's not like that Harkon guy that's coming out um, at the same time as Primarius Kelgar. 
No, this guy looks cool. That Hakan guy looks fucking retarded. Because he's he's you know, he's all over the shop. Anyway. So you got Imperial Robots, you've got Google Him Chaos, you have interesting sort of tech thralls in the kit, you've got Google Him Renegade Guardsmen, you also got some different sentries and things like that. So it's it's giving us a wide range of new miniatures, and I don't really think I could call any of it Grim Derp, which I think is the best part of all. Grim Derp, of course, is when you take something that should be dark and menacing, and then you sloppity bile piper it. You turn it into a happy, fun, um, goofy sort of aesthetic, or you take something that is dark, but you try and make it so dark, it just ends up going over the top and becomes comical by sheer nature. This entire set avoids that. So Grim Derp might be applied to that Harkon guy, as I said. So overall, Blackstone Fortress is a win, especially because it's also Warhammer Quest in 40k, whereas Warhammer Quest for the last few years has been something exclusively taking place in uh, the fantasy battle setting. So yeah, this is pretty cool. All right, Custodians. I like the Alarius Custodians. They're not Terminators. Uh, they're not Aqualon Terminators. The Aqualon Terminators, of course, are the Heresy Era Terminators for the Custodes. They're big, menacing, brooding, look sweet. The Alarius Custodians, on the other hand, are more of an up-armored version of the regular Custodians. And I think they look great. They're a good blend of bling, but not over the top. Yes, they've got cloaks, but the cloaks aren't over the top, and they've got a good range of weapons, upgrades, banners, that kind of thing. All in all, pretty well-balanced design. So I like it. The worst thing that they got this year was the Venerable Land Raider. When they could bring out things like a grav tank for the Primaris Space Marines, and yet for the Custodians, they can't even be bothered letting them either use that same tank or getting their own unique vehicle, like what Forgeville did. All they did was give a lazy reskin to a Land Raider. They couldn't even bring themselves to give it Inquisition doors. Yeah, okay, it's got some decals and things like that you can put on it, but it's like, really? You couldn't even put fucking doors on it. Like, he could have taken some doors off a Corvus Black Star or something, maybe. You know, well, obviously not Inquisition doors, I guess. It is a different faction of the Imperium, the Custodians, but something, anything, you know? Like, maybe bigger quillers on the doors. Um, the Space Marine Limited Edition Nottingham Warhammer World Exclusive Land Raider Command Tank that you can buy with, like, Aquilas all over it and stuff like that. that tank would have been better <laughs> in this army like it's just it reeks of laziness it's like oh we better give them a transport oh, fuck it they can just have an existing tank from as i said before 20 years ago and this is a 20 year old tank you're looking at right now that's the best they're gonna get and that's pretty fucking depressing it's like if you're gonna bother bringing out a faction for your game at least, you know, make it a viable faction in its own right. It's something I think they've also got wrong with the Mechanicum range in 40Ks. They give it sort of... It's got the stepping stone. It's got the foundation there of a good faction, a good army. But there's no variety to it. There's no uh, scope to it. It's like, here's three box sets which have two different builds in each box set. Okay, enjoy. It's like, no, that's not enough. You've got to fully flesh out a faction if you bring it out. You can't keep throwing all of your fucking resources at something like Primaris Marines, where you already had a full faction of Space Marines, which is the biggest by far, and then you added another full faction to that. No, if, if you're doing a faction, you need to go out there and you need to go, okay, they need transports, they need anti-air, they need aerial units of their own right, not just the anti-air. They need artillery unit, they need some heavy hitting combat units if possible i mean obviously the tower an exception to that but some heavy hitting combat units they need some good elite units something that's very shooty in that elite section they need uh multiple hq choices you know this is something that they fell down on with the custodians they fell down with the mechanicum they fell down with the sisters of silence so a lot of half-assing has gone on here where it's like 
the step the stepping stones are there you can make great factions here with just a tiny bit more investment instead of giving us our 67th Primaris Lieutenant for the year. Alright, moving on. Armager Warglaives. I think these were the best release for the Imperial Knights this year. They're an interesting looking unit. They don't take anything away from our existing knights because they're not competing with them they're not that same size they're not finding in that same slot yeah okay then not very impressive in the war gear department let's face it but they're not meant to be this is basically a dreadnought sized unit uh maybe a cross between a sentinel and a dreadnought but they look cool they're interesting i'd like to see them incorporated wisely into the horus heresy and overall, they're not a very derpy unit, which is the other thing you worry about. I think the worst aspects of the model is maybe the little skull iconography on top of the sort of thigh plates and on the shoulder pads. There's a little skull randomly put into the trim. It has no purpose being there. It's almost like when they designed this thing in uh, CAD, they just went, eh, pff, fuck it. Let's just add that asset that we've got on for the sake of it. It has no point being there, but it is. All right, worst release for me this year was this fucking thing, the Knight Castellan. Now, why does this annoy me? Not because it's a terrible model, it looks okay. But the thing is, if you can slap this much weaponry and war gear onto an Imperial Knight, why didn't you slap this much war gear and armament onto an Imperial Knight? It's not that much bigger than a regular Imperial Knight. It shares a lot of the same parts. All in all, it just it's a weird choice to me. It's almost like they tried to make a Warlord Titan and shrink it down and then release it as a knight because it has weapons up on the shoulders like a Warlord Titan. It has weapons either side of the head um, like a Warlord Titan can. It has the underslung arm weapons, of course, and it's even got this stupid little missile launcher on the back up top. It's like, how many more things could you slap onto this? This is like those fucking uh, orc scratch builds people make just for fun, where they take like a knight and then slap four billion guns on it and call it like a Gorgonord or something. That's the Imperial equivalent. This thing is grim derp because it's gone so over the top now, it's gone past the point of being serious and something you're like, well, I guess I could see that in a science fiction world, to, oh, really? That thing looks retarded. So, yeah. This thing was stunted at birth, unfortunately. Um, if it was a bigger knight, and I mean significantly bigger, like a knight perifan just below the size of, say, a Warhound Titan, okay, that I could get on board with. Because, like, you've scaled up, and now you can justify the fact you've got all this extra firepower on board your vehicle. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of it. Instead, what we have here is a regular knight-sized unit, which has a lot more firepower than a regular knight, and there's a lot of question marks as to why. Now, there's some sort of in-universe law you can use to justify this sort of bullshit, but that law only exists to justify this sort of bullshit. It's not law that sort of comes about naturally or suits the actual environment of the science fiction universe. It's just the sort of oh, well, you know, they'd love to make more, but they're very hard to build, you know, the resources and all that sort of thing. It's, it gives a lot of rare alloys, and it's the same excuse they use for, like, Tower Riptides. It's like, oh, you know, it's it's made of unobtainium, and because this rare resource uh, is so hard to find, you've got to alloy it with uh, bullshitanium. Yeah, it's we can't hardly make any of these. It's a lame excuse. Just scale it up next time, and... It won't annoy me at all. Alright. Cool release for the Primaris Marines is the Apothecary. This guy perfectly sums up what I like to see. The only thing I dislike on the model, only thing, is that he's got these three purity seals on his chest. And that's it. Everything else about it looks great. The sort of servo harness with medical instruments that he's got, perfect. 
that is something I would happily use on any 30k apothecary, 40k apothecary, looks great. It's neat, it's slim, it's not over the top. Same with his little uh, viewing glass microscope in sort of front of his head. The fact that it like swivels out of the way off to the side there and he can use it for inspecting stuff, that's pretty cool. It's a neat design, as well as the fact that he's got, you know, the, the medical sort of pistol with the syringe built in, the, the narcathium reductor, what have you. All looks great. Like I said, the only thing that really lets him down is the three purity seals on his chest. Alright, the negative. What did they release for the Primaris Space Marines this year, which I think was stupid? Four billion zillion fucking lieutenants. Oh, so sick of Primaris lieutenants. Nine. Nine of them. This has become a meme at this point. You release nine lieutenants, and you can't redo the fucking Phoenix Lords for the Eldar. You can't redo Lucius the Eternal. You can't redo Abaddon the Despoiler. Well, I mean, he may get done in 80 days or whenever, but hasn't happened yet. Didn't happen in 2018. You have models which are nearly 30 years old in the range. 20 year old models like the Land Raider that you're still pushing in armies. And you spend your resources on Primaris left hands. What the fuck are you thinking, Games Workshop? Are you selling that many of these overpriced fucking things that it was worth it? Like, come on! <laughs> Nine lieutenants in one year. Fucking so over the top. Christ, what do I say? Everyone at home is thinking it right now. You're all like, yeah, that's a bit excessive. And that's a problem. We shouldn't be going, that's excessive. We should have been going, oh man, I'm so glad that they released a new Baharoth model this year. He was my favorite Phoenix Lord growing up, and it's just great to see him actually, like, you know. I'm not saying those Jess Goodwin sculpts didn't stand the test of time. I mean, they've done so well, those models. The fact that they've gotten to nearly 30 years old and people are still using them really says a lot for how well they were originally sculpted, but the age is incredibly showing on the moment. Abaddon, for example, is tiny compared to the Terminators of today. He should be something as big as Gilliman, you know? He should be terrifying to look at when he's leading the forces of chaos in battle. And I can only hope that when they do redo him, they take on the aesthetics of his 30k model, so he should be wearing cataphracty armor, and he should look similar to the Lord in the Blackstone Fortress. The last thing I want to see is him grim derped up. I don't want to see him looking like that Harkan, the Claimer, or whatever his name is, that uh, other Chaos Lord with the jump pack they just released. That is the exact opposite of the look I want. I don't want excessive gold trim, Games Workshop. I don't want excessive trophy racks that stick out on awkward angles and all those weird sort of things about that guy. No. If you're going to do it, do it right. Give us something that's pretty down to earth, but large and menacing. No more Primaris Marines. We're sick of Primaris Marines. And every time you bring out one this year, I'm going to make so much fun of it because it's so retarded. All right. Good things, good things, good things. Nighthaunt Lady Alinda. I love this model. She has the banshees with her. She's got these roses and this thorn work. And this is grim and beautiful at the same time. And it's something that's really been lacking. Um, we've gone very kid-friendly, very cartoonish in Age of Sigma. Let's face it, it's not a dark, menacing game. Uh, this rectifies that to some extent. This is haunting and beautiful, and forgive the pun because it is ghosts, but it is hauntingly beautiful. The only thing that disappoints me on this model is the two banshees with her, the skulls on them, a bit derpy. They're very rounded off, they don't have like the sharp edges you expect on skulls. Um, they're very cartoonish in style, but that's it. 
that's the only nitpick I've got for this otherwise beautiful model. Now, this is my choice for the bad models. The Licaron, the Executioner. This is not a bad model. I actually really like this model. But the thing I don't like is the derpy looking skulls coming out of the axe. Yeah, it's... It pretty much ruins what's otherwise a fantastic looking model. The whole hunched over Grim Reaper sort of aspect. I mean, they didn't go for the scythe. The scythe is the easy choice. They went for the axe. Executioner's axe. Great. All for it. Uh, the hint of a skull poking through the cloak, the shroud over him. Yep. Cool. Again, could have gone for the Grim Reaper thing with just the empty hood or even having a skull within the hood, but the fact the hood's down over the skull, great stylistic choice. So even the bad choice here, I've got praise for. But these little ghostly sprites, um, little skeletal cum stains, yeah, they're not necessary, and they actually take away from the model. I guess they did it to try and make the model more interesting, because otherwise without them, is pretty plain and boring. But I think there's other things they could have done, like, you know, instead of sitting on top of a tombstone, he could have had, like, an executioner's block under him, or perhaps um, a beheaded body at his feet. You know, things like that would have been a really cool way of marking him out as different. Instead, we've got some derpy skeletal cum stains. Alright. For the Adonith Deepkin, a faction I really dislike... Uh, Latan Warden of the Soul Wedges is my pick for a good model. I think he looks pretty cool. Um, I find something hilarious where it's gone from bad to good again in the fact that he's running around with an octopus that's armed to the teeth. <laughs> I don't know, it's like like the images you're seeing like online of like, you know, videos of lobsters holding knives and crabs holding knives. It's like that same sort of thing. It's like, here's a creature that shouldn't be running around with a knife, and he's got a knife and a mace. It's hilarious to me. It's reasonably well designed as well, surprisingly organic. Um, Games Workshop has pretty much lost the ability to sculpt things which look organic. And what do I mean by that? I mean smooth, free-flowing shapes. You'll notice that a lot of their miniatures now have really hard edges to them, especially on their musculature. Uh, on the edges of muscles, they they come to like a sharp point. Even on the cloak, you can see where the uh, edge highlighting is on Latan's cloak. Uh, as it moves up, sort of where his knees are, there's these very sharp points. There's these real straight, sharp lines all over the models. Because they're sculpting things digitally, they've got to use a wireframe model. They aren't sitting there with green stuff moving around their hands, so you can make a smooth, organic shape, make something that's round. Instead, you're using a computer, which means every, when you try and make something round, you've got to draw lots and lots of tiny, tiny, tiny little straight lines that give the illusion of something being round. And that's where they fall down. It's a limitation of the design software. And it's, it's becoming distracting for me. I made fun of it in the sort of New Year's and Christmas special that I did because it's something that's very excessive and in some model ranges has really gone over the top. That said, however, jokes aside, this is actually a nice model, so let's give it its due. My pick for worst model is the Ishran Soul Render. Um, I don't have anything nice to say about this. It has... The pose of a miniature from the 1990s with none of the nostalgia. Its weaponry is oversized. I get that it's trying to be like a bilge hook, for example, something like that. Um, a fishing implement. Bilge hooks are a lot fucking smaller than that. In fact, they're quite tiny. Um, meh. The anglerfish sort of style lantern on top of his helmet. Why? It's also the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 villain or the Mega Man villain um, in that fish that he's got on the base. It's. I 
yeah, I've got nothing. It's just a total misstep for me. I can't even say, oh, if they'd done this or this, it would have looked great. And it's now, nah. <laughs> it's just shit. All right. Well, for the daughters of Cain, Marathi is both my pick for best and worst. How do you pick it to be the best and the worst, Macca? Well, I there was something brooding, something seductive. I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase it. You see, when I first started playing Fantasy, it was about the same time they released the initial Dark Elves. And I remember the original Marathi when she first got released, and it's like almost a taboo. I was a young teenager, not even a teenager, in fact, I think I might have still been an adolescent. And here's this model with, you know, tits out. She's, you know, this horrible, conniving sorceress, evil to the core, riding a dark Pegasus. And she was really unique, that sort of style with, you know, the breasts out and riding the dark stallion. It's like, okay, that's interesting. You know, I want to know more about this model. Marathi made it into a lot of people's dark elf armies because of that. She looked more menacing than Malleus Darkblade or um, her son. But the thing is, in upgrading her to the new Marathi, they took all of that away. The sexuality is completely gone in this miniature. Now, I get it, you want to be a little bit more kid-friendly, you know, Age of Sigmar is your cartoonish game to bring in the kids, and a lot of people are like, oh, it's doing really well at the moment. Uh, that may vary from area to area. You know, just because you can get a big turnout at one tournament, like LVO, for example, and you can get heaps of people there playing your fantasy game, doesn't mean it's super popular, it just means that the people who do enjoy it are all willing to go and they want to go. And that's fine, that's great for them, but you can't use it as a measure of success for the hobby. I mean, I can tell you that every 30k tournament I go to packed with people, and yet lots of people like to turn around and say, well, you know, I don't see any 30k in my area. Okay, cool. So, this model looks fantastic. But it's not the character I grew up with, I guess is the point I'm getting at. It's really disappointing in that regard, because here you had the chance to have the beast of Marathi. She could look like that, the sort of Medusa with the wings and that. It would have been great to see the old style Marathi, however, on foot, not with the silly metallic wings. Especially with like the blood or ichor or poison or whatever dripping off the edges. It, that makes no sense. Why is it there? How'd it get there? You know, how come it hasn't all come up, run off yet? Like it's Why are they juicy? Why are the wings juicy? It's a disappointment. The model on foot really just looks more like a generic sorceress of the Dark Elves. Uh, with even less flesh showing. So it would have been great to see them do something more. Like the original Marathi model with her there. Perhaps bare-chested, for example. I mean, do we really care if a model has exposed breasts in this day and age? Like, I don't give a fuck. I'm looking at it for the aesthetics. I'm not looking at it for the sexual gratification. You know, and I don't think a lot of teenagers get into the hobby art either. I think, yes, there is that element of taboo to it, as I said earlier. Um, as, ooh, you know, that's different. But that's it. That's where it begins and ends. And so to lose that is a bit of a shame. Because, again, I think the large version of Marathi here, great miniature, but the version on foot is just a betrayal of her. Even if she's trying to be this alluring, sort of deceptive queen in disguise. I don't care. Alright, for the 40k Death Guard, the Nauseous Rotbone. Now, say what you will about the terrible naming conventions of Copyright Friendly Games Workshop, but this is an okay looking model. Probably the best model in the Death Guard range, which is why I chose it. Yes, he's got some mutations. There's a little bit of, like, tentacle sneaking out from under the shoulder pad. And another little one coming out from behind his knee, holding a little bell. But that's it. They kept it toned the fuck down. Now, again, mutation. That's Zench's thing. Now, I'm not saying that Chaos can't have mutation. Chaos can have mutations. Sure. But... Nurgle is not a god whose mutations are tentacles. Never has been. 
Tentacles are very rare when portrayed in Nurgle as a whole. The only thing that could maybe be said to be a tentacled thing is the beast of Nurgle, and even then they were really just a slug. They had a long leech or slug-like body. They weren't covered in tentacles. They were, in essence, a single tentacle. So to see them become like the defining aspect of the Death Guard, that's a real shame. Um, also like coral-like growths and weird horns and stuff like that. Oh, it's just so over the top. Um, a great thing they did here was the sword. It's a saw and it's like rotted and infected. They stayed away from the derpy um, weapons that were clearly growing spines like Mortarian Scythe. I think that looks bad. Uh, they stayed away from the Plague Bearer style weapons like some of the Nurgle champions have where it's like like napped flint. Again, that's something I think would look really great if you applied it to, say, corn. Like, flint is one of those early weapons that humans made, you know, the things we first hunted with, the things we first probably killed one another with were flint-based weapons, like flint-tipped spears and flint arrowheads, things like that. Um, that suits corn and his more aggressive nature, whereas Nurgle should be having, like, rusted... Um, corroded weaponry so like tarnished bronzes and rusted iron things like that are in his nature and so this slightly damaged armor with little pox marks on it and blemishes this speaks much more to Nurgle the fact that this model isn't smiling with some derpy fucking grin on his head and that he's got just sort of like a rotted cadaverish look to his face perfect I don't like the tongue coming out of the little skull on top of his backpack. I don't even know why that's a tiny little skull there. It makes no sense. Yes, there are things on this model I would change. But overall, it's a really nice model. And this is what I wish the new Death Guard was. Ignore the paint job and just look at it for a model. This is a nice model. The same can't be said of Lord Felthius the Tainted uh, and his Tainted Cohort. This sums up everything I fucking despise about the new Death Guard. He has that ridiculous, derpy grin on his face. He has the stupid horns and coral-like growths, fake smoke sculpted on rolling out of his armor. Everything is oozing slime and pus, and there's weird tentacle stuff coming out of everywhere. It's like the tick list of everything bad about modern Nurgle sculpts. So it's like where Nauseous Rocks Bringer or Rock Bone, whatever the fuck this thing's copyright called, this is a model that you're like, yeah, okay, that's a space marine who is corroded, fallen on hard times, you know. Like a space marine who's been riddled with bullets and being left to rot in his armor in a fucking ditch on some battlefield. This, on the other hand, is the opposite of that this does not give off that vibe at all it's like what is all this weird fleshy stuff is that like a symbiotic organism is that like the fucking alien from the movie life you know it's about to kill ryan reynolds again you did not see that coming um why is there like random fucking pus coming off everything why is everything we can, like how is the ball he's holding in his left hand Leaking out the top. That's not how gravity works. Liquids don't leak up, they leak down. It Shouldn't it be coming out of the holes in the sides of it and the bottom of it? Not the top. Who sculpted this? It makes no fucking sense. It's messing with my chi. And it's like, they have tried to go for this look of like all this ruined and tarnished stuff. And yet all the leather straps on the models are nearly in pristine nick. They look like they could be leather straps on any other model. They don't look like they have, like, mold or fungus or, like, the leather's rotting. I mean, anyone who's seen old leather knows that that thing's probably going to cop it the worst. Um, instead, they've got like, these pristine leather belt buckles. They look like any cataphracty Terminators in the Horus Heresy. <laughs> like, it makes no sense. Who sculpted this? Like, ugh. And then you got Flyboy over there on the right who's got, like, all these little, like, hairs or horns growing out all over his armor and just... Oh, it's so over the top. It's so bad. It's comical. And that's the thing. This and this are the same fucking faction. Let that sink in. It, it, oh, so bad. <laughs> All right. Lord of the Rings. 
my pick for worst thing in Lord of the Rings, the Battle of the Palinor Fields. Now, I hear Lord of the Rings players, you are happy with anything you get. Now, something that's come up before, and I'll reiterate it here for the people who aren't familiar with the channel, myself and the Lord of the Rings community have a bit of a back and forth going on, where basically I make a video about Lord of the Rings that expresses what I think are pretty fair um, perceptions of the state of the game over the years. And they basically go off at me because they love the game so much they cannot see flaws within it. And they constantly say, oh, you need to go on like Green Dragon podcast and listen to them. Or you need to go watch what's happening at GBHL. And the community is very popular. And, you know, I don't care what your community is like. I care what the company is doing with the product. Okay. Your community is fucking cancerous. And not because it's bad, not because it's bad to other people, not because it's elitist, it's not any of that. It's a really warm, welcoming envir uh, environment for people. Uh, people are obviously getting very confused right now when I say it's still cancerous and yet it's a welcoming environment. It's cancerous because you'll accept anything no matter how bad it is. This is a rules book released and all the miniatures in it come from pretty much the year 2002 with the exception of the new Theoden. 2002, come on, the oldest kit in here, the Riders of Rohan are from 2002, the newest kit in here, Theoden, was made for this box as part of the selling point of it, and the uh, Moranon Orcs, Cave Troll, uh, sorry, Mordor Troll, that kind of thing, they were kits that were updated, I think 2005 they went to plastic. Um, when they came out in 2003, Return of the King, they were actually white metal at the time. So to about 2005, they got their update to plastics. So here you have essentially kits that age roam between sort of 17 and 15 years, roughly in age, maybe a bit less, maybe 13 years in age, being sold as a full price new release. Now, if you're happy with that, great fine perfect but don't tell me to be happy with that because i think that's a piss poor effort on behalf of the company if you want to sell miniatures that you've had the molds for and you paid off 15 fucking years ago sell them at a discount you can't keep hyping the fucking price and the inflation up on that shit games workshop that's bullcrap if a car company keeps a car in production year after year after year it comes down in price it doesn't go up in price right like CX-5, we bought a CX-5, and that model uh, was $35,000 like stock before we added anything else to it, right? That's my missus' car. And that thing came down to like 30000 when they bought out the new model. So it was like a $5,000 drop. Games Workshop doesn't do that. They're not like, oh, well, you know, here's the old model. Drop the price on it when they bring out, like, you know, Primaris Kelgar, when he comes out, are they going to drop the price on the existing Marnie's color? No, they won't. They'll just pull it completely from the web store. They don't have a sale or anything like that. There's very weird fucking shit that goes on at Games Workshop because they're not a professional company. Now, people like to go, oh, but they're worth millions of dollars. Look how much they've made out of something. Yeah, making money is not an indicator of your success as a company. It's an indicator or... How should I put that, actually? I need to reword that. Making money is not an indicator of how well run your company is, merely that people are spending money with you. Think of all those companies that have gone broke, despite the fact they were so-called professional companies, especially like all those startups and app manufacturers right now. They come out, they're around for a year or two, releasing apps, they make millions of dollars, you see the owners, are some dudes in their 20s, they're all over TV, and they're like, oh, you know, you've made millions, you're such a success story, and then like next year they're broke, because they didn't know what they were fucking doing. They were just some dudes who made apps in their basement. They were really good at that. And when they made it mainstream and shareholders got involved, it all turned to shit. Next Games Workshop. This company has no idea what they're doing, but there's a reason the term failing upwards exists. And it exists for companies like Games Workshop. And this here, the Lord of the Rings, the Battle of Palinor Fields, shows exactly that. You're releasing kits that are, you know, 17 to 13, I'll give that rough period. 17 to 13 year old kits released as a full price release and people are gobbling it up 
Now, that's not Games Workshop playing it smart. Any other company released something that shady, except outside maybe the video games market, people would not buy the product. But here, the fans love it so much, they're buying the product. And I think it's amazing. Like, if someone's a psychologist out there, you should like get on this, find out how this is happening. Because, you know, there's some interesting shit going on right here, surely. I can't just be the only one thinking this. Anyway. Crazy Macca conspiracy rants over. Good things. The Nazgul release. I like this for two reasons. One, they were faithful to the film and released all these cool looking Nazgul. The second thing that's good about this is that four of these Nazgul share similar rules. Uh, the Slayers of Men and that. And you'll see that there's a couple of guys to one towards the back they've got like a long staff with a club at one end and there's also a couple of guys towards the back who are holding swords one has two swords sort of one leaning on his shoulder and the other one's just got a bare hand on one side so um they're identical rules wise they actually gave enough of a crap though to sculpt different models for them that is fantastic that's attention to detail they didn't just go with Oh, well, since this model has the same rules, we'll just use two of the same. They actually cared enough to give them their own individual sculpt. That's great to see. I think that's great to see. Um, it's a bit of a shame, though, that they did only write them with those rules, that they are double-ups of the rules. It would have been great to still see them called by, like, you know, the Tainted, the Undying, the Betrayer. It would have been great to see those names used for them. Um... Kamul the Easterling, you know. Instead, though, they couldn't be stuffed using those names, and they just gave them like some generic, new, copyright-friendly, whatever. Maybe, maybe uh, New Line Cinema or whoever's running the show now, Warner Brothers, dictated that they had to be um, those specific names and stuff. I don't think so, but um, otherwise, they're great. Would have been great if they shared that lineage with the existing metal ring wraiths that you can get, which have their own unique sort of spin on ring wraith rules. Um, I have all of them, by the way. For people who, for some reason, people don't think I love all the rings here. I've got all the ring wraiths, and all like you know, they're tainted, undying. Yeah, I've got all of them. So would have been great to see some of that, but in any case, these are a beautiful sculpt. They're all unique. They've all got these cool, interesting weapons. They look true to the films. Yeah. There's nothing you can really say that's super negative about it. It's more just a wish list of things I wish they'd done with it. Nothing's bad here, and that's great to see. All right. Negative for the Horus Heresy, for me, is the entire Space Wolves range, pretty much. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Wolfkin of Russ. They're fine. Uh, Russ himself, of course, is a great model, and the Space Wolves Contemptor is not terrible. It's got a bit of a Sutton Who sort of look about it with, um, like, a sort of Saxon face mask. But then the rest of the Space Wolf range. The Space Wolf Praetor, the Varagia Terminators, the Grey Slayers upgrades. Ugh. What a fucking mediocre year for the Space Wolves. I mean, it's just getting worse. With Haval Redblade, aka Fat Bastard, coming out. Oh, God. I don't know how they did it. How do you bungle Space Wolves? Something that they've been successfully doing for 40k. I mean, the complaints people had about 40k were that they went over the top with the Frost stuff, and they went over the top with the Wolf stuff. And Forge World's problem was they reduced those elements, which is fine. Uh, reduce them or replace them with more like Saxon style iconography but when they did try and touch the wolf stuff like wolf pelts especially they just failed on every level like the banana fur on the Varagia like let's open that up and have a look at him this is an accepted finished sculpt look at that fur nobody has said that is a good sculpt nobody even the biggest Fucking 40k, 30k shills out there. The biggest fanboys are like, Ugh, that's not good. <laughs> and the fact that it looks like they've got hundreds of wolf's teeth dangling off their armor is terrible. 
okay and on top of that the faces are sculpted terribly it's like because you have a mouth and it's got like um facial hair around it that means your mouth should look smaller your mouth should not be sculpted bigger you see facial hair obscures facial details doesn't enhance it so you've got these two space wolf dudes out the front of the squad here who have like these big fucking pengu newt newt mouths going on it's like what the hell were you thinking when you sculpted these like you could have just used existing space wolf heads from 40k on these terminators it would have looked better <laughs> like or helmets did you ever consider helmets like some nice cataphracty helmets with some like maybe that sort of what you did with the contemptor the sutton who sort of celtic viking um saxon style like eye sockets with like the gold um trim around the eyes like that could have looked really unique and engaging on these models so it's like whenever you tried to put wolf stuff on your space wolves you failed wherever you try to do something like oh you know they have uh their heads exposed it's like you failed to sculpt decent heads on them when it came to the weapons like look at this terminator on the bottom right his fist looks huge holding that axe in his hand it's like something sculpted in the late 90s i there are so many fails with this range and it's amazing it's like a it's like watching a train crash you can't look away it's just wow this professional company and again just because they make money doesn't mean they know what they're doing and this is a great example of that because this is a bad kit released by the company they didn't pull it they didn't try and do something better with it they released it as is and i don't think it's sold very well i've not seen any out in the wild um i have seen Viragia being used in games but generally they're either people bought these kits cut all the fur off and then sculpted new fur on i've seen that or they took like the shoulders off these minis and maybe the legs and transplanted on um transplanted onto regular legion cataphracty terminators like it's crazy to think that people out there after having the official kit released would rather convert their own you know that really says something yeah all right what do i think is a really good release for 30k this year uh, I'd say the Terex Pattern Termite Assault Drill. This thing here is fantastic because A, it's something different, and B, everyone can use it. Well, Imperial Knights aren't going to use it. Um, Custodes aren't using it, so I guess I lied. But Mechanicum, Solar Auxilia, Militia, Space Marines, they're all able to use it. So, you know, the main fighting forces of 30k. This is fantastic. It's a nice looking kit. It doesn't take the place of a drop pod it has its own unique features that make it desirable in its own way uh, especially having that 12 model transport capacity is a game changer that's something that the imperial militia especially lacked um without the gorgons in production currently the missing gorgon assault transport this is something you can actually get their veterans across the battlefield because the aurochs can't with a 10-man transport capacity for 12 model squads doesn't work this thing, however, does have the transport capacity. This is the sort of units they need to bring out for 30k. Something that more than a single faction can use. This is where I think the Blood Angels of Leviathan fell down. In that, yeah, it looks alright. But it's not a model that should exist for that faction. Because unless they're giving the Blood Angels a unique Leviathan, they could have just got away with an Assault Cannon Upgrade kit for existing Leviathans. Yeah, let's be honest. The only faction who should have a unique Dreadnought type is the Thousand Suns because it's a psychic Dreadnought. Apart from that, give everyone their own unique Contemptor, by all means. Right, the Thousand Suns, they got the Assyrian because that's a Librarian Dreadnought. They're the only ones who are going to get that, let face facts. You know, I doubt very much that the World Eater is going to be running Librarian Dreadnoughts, come on. There was no need give the blood angels their own leviathan someone just got carried away in the design department and they wasted a resource on that this on the other hand is not wasted resources because solar can use it militia can use it mechanicum can use it marines can use it if a lot of factions can use something that is good okay that's expanding the game for everyone 
not darrowing it. That is the best thing about this model. So that's it. That brings us to the end of this sort of roundup of miniatures this year. This is a long episode with a lot of ranting and raving, but I think again, I think I was pretty fair about it. I said what I think was great, and I talk a bit about the bad business decisions and the things I think are not great. Uh, generally, it's not the quality of the sculpts that let them down. It was more individual design decisions on those sculpts. Little things that if you tweak them or remove them, dramatically change my perception of the miniature, and I think for a lot of people. Now, by all means, feel free to disagree me, uh, with me in the comments below. The Lord of the Rings players, I expect to see you there. You always pop up. You always tell me that you're happy to be fucked in the ass by Games Workshop. Just so long as you get a new model, you don't care. Um, it's pathetic and worn very thin, but hey, pop up in the chat and say it anyway, because you always do. Anyway, make with the outer circle. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.